All right. Hello, everybody. I uh, have something special for you today for the Kumiai channel. I am doing something that's actually been, um, I've been thinking about for quite some time. Um, I've been teaching for five years now, and I, there's a lot of things I, I felt that teachers could have done better. Um, and one of the things, probably the main thing is, is teaching me how to write papers, research papers. There's a lot of things I figured out on my own. And then there's a lot of things that I was taught by teachers over the years. I have over 290 college units. Um, I should have a PhD by now, but I, uh, I just basically took a bunch of classes at different universities for, you know, without getting into it too much. I took a lot of classes. So I've been writing a lot. I've always felt writing was really hard for me. Um, I remember my graduate school, I said I wasn't a good writer. My, my professor's like, well, you better be by now. And this is one of those things where I never, and I still struggle with writing. So I just, kind of, the reason why I'm saying that is because um, I'm 40 years old. I've been writing forever. I've taken college forever. Uh, and it's always humbling is how I would say writing. And it depends on the assignment you're given. So some assignments <clears throat> I've been writing, I've been kind of commissioned to write uh, curriculum lately. Um, I did a Kumeyaay oral history project where I did uh, uh, basically a short history on each individual of 26 interviews, 31 people. And so that was challenging. <clears throat> so it depends on what you're writing. Um, obviously the hardest thing I probably wrote was my master's thesis, but that's not just, that's not always the case. You know, people think how, how much you write is hard. It's actually what you write about is hard and the challenges that you have with the, with the assignment. So you can make your, your papers harder or easier depending on what topic you pick. And that's something I learned, um, throughout the years. So I always picked my topics wisely, making sure I had the content, the resource to get the objective done. Um, so um, with the, with the, with, uh, let me just start off with my master's thesis. So with my master's thesis, what I did was I wrote on Indian gaming and the challenge with gaming was there was no um, content, there was no resource. So I had to go out and get it myself uh, I, I think, and the problem was, was I didn't do it enough to where my master's thesis was, I think it was pretty incomplete in many ways, because I just didn't have the time. So what I ended up doing was with my Kumeyaay oral history project, I went and completed my master's. So if you read my master's thesis and the Kumeyaay oral history project, like you, if you watched every interview, uh, read the preface of each person, you would see um, that was truly the completion of my master's thesis. So I had questions unanswered that I went out to interview Danny Tucker, Saquon, Anthony Pico Viejas, Joe Welch of Barona, and then our, our attorney, um, Art Bunce, who was the attorney for all of us at one point uh, in, in this area. And so um, I really picked a really hard topic and I'm glad I did but it took me how long to accomplish it? Years. So sometimes you have to go above and beyond the call of duty if you really want to do something. So be careful what topic you pick. That's my point. And you better be ready to put in the time to accomplish that topic. Uh, so, uh, and, you know, I want to talk about that moment in time when I'm sitting in my graduate class and my professor says, uh, Professor Gonzalez at USD, he's an incredible uh, Berkeley graduate. And you could tell he went to Berkeley. It was really hard, but really good. And um, and um, he said, okay, time to pick a topic, everybody. What do you want to write on? And it, it's terrifying. It's like, okay, so what are you going to do for like 80 pages? So this is my master's thesis. Where are we? You get this like fancy little book. I don't think it, it can, it's not gonna, anyways. It's a it's a really long title, Socioeconomic Impact of Indian Gaming on Kumeyaay Nations, a case study of Brona Viejas and Saquon, 1982 to 2015. 
2016. So yeah, it's definitely um, <clears throat> a complicated title. But um, so this was 80 pages. I think the minimum was 60 or whatever. Uh, the cool thing was, is while I was halfway through it, um, I, I was able to get, uh, what's the word? So it was offered to me by the San Diego History Center and Irish Inkstrand, my uh, professor at the time, she was chair of my, my, uh, my um, yeah, that's the other thing. So when you get, when you're doing a master's program or, or PhD, you have a chair. So you have a couple people that will oversee you. And so Iris was at the San Diego History Center at the time, and I had chapter four published in here. So I, I was really lucky to literally get published before I was even out of uh, graduate school. And this was, you know, this is why I chose gaming. I wanted to do something no one ever did. It's something that would matter and something people would read. So that's one of my biggest fears was Professor Gonzalez. He said a, um, a couple of times that no one ever read his master's thesis. Uh, he did something on Mexico. He's a Mexican American. I he took Chicano history and I took Chicano history with him. Really cool class. But what he said was like terrifying to me. <laughs> like no one ever read his master's thesis. So to me, I, that was a worse fate than putting in how many hours I put in because I really wanted him to. to I really want people to read my stuff. And I think that's, to me, what reading writing is all about. It's about the audience. It's about who you're writing to. It's about accomplishing a goal and purpose that people find purposeful. And, you know, no one reads anymore, let's be honest. And so we, you better have something really compelling to do it. So that leads me to my first point is uh, write what you know. So I was born and raised in Indian gaming um, era. I was born in 1981. Gaming came to Barona in 1982. And uh, my dad was on council at the time. So I was born and raised in Indian gaming. So that leads me to my first point about when you choose to pick your topic and you, when you write, nothing beats authenticity and writing what you know. So a lot of students ask me, what should I write about uh, this or that? And I guarantee you one of those options is something you know better and you feel better. Um, I have students, you know, often they'll pick a bunch of topics when they write their papers and then one paragraph or two will be uh, really compelling, you know? And I'm like, man, you should have just wrote on that. That was your, that was your topic, but you, you did all this other stuff. So you have to really know who you are what you're good at and what you're not good at and stick to what stick to that one thing and that's it don't veer off into the weeds and that's what we do when we're young and when we're inexperienced and i did it i've done it quite a bit myself where i'm i end up in the weeds somewhere and it's like my paper is is weak so you have to know who you are write what you know write what you have access to so here's one of the things uh, before I move off of my master's thesis, I wanna talk about what, what I like to do when I write. So what I do is I find, uh, I, love, I love a good fight. I probably could have been a good lawyer. I love, I love taking apart people's arguments and debates, but I don't really do it well with my words, I guess. Um, but I do, I do better with writing because I, I get a chance to sit and relax. And I usually like people, you know, people can get the best of me often in, in face to face because I guess I'm overreacted. I'm, I'm very emotional, impulsive, you know, but when it comes to writing, I think I'm at my best because, you know, say, no one can really get me when I write. And that's how I always feel like, cause I'll find a way to get you. And, but usually um, it's not, it's not, how do I say this? If I'm not going to engage in a in a war, I can't win. Let's just say that. So if I'm wrong, if I'm not on the right path, I'll just switch. I probably wouldn't be doing it, first of all. So I typically engage in battles. I think I can win. And honestly, you know I can win. So what I do is this. Uh, for example, this, this is a book that came out in 2015 in the middle of my master's thesis, Wampum. Wampum is a currency that the Eastern natives used. Um, so it's kind of, uh, anyways, it reads this, how Indian tribes, the mafia, 
and an inattentive Congress invented Indian gaming and created a $28 billion gaming empire, to now $30 billion. David Craig Mitchell is an anti-Indian, anti-gaming uh, Congress person. He actually tried to interview Art Bunce, the person I interviewed on our tribe, <clears throat> and Art Bunce said no, because he knew he was, he was against gaming. But what I do is this. So I, I love a good debate. And what I did was I took his arguments and I turned them on their head. And that's so I and but here's one thing I like to do, too, is, is when when someone's right, give that to them. You don't always have to be right. You can be half right or mostly right. And they could be some right. And so often we don't do that. It's like black and white. But, you know, guess what? History is not black and white. Sometimes the opponent has a little has a point that needs to be made and said. So what I do, and I think this is what makes a paper even stronger <clears throat> and scholarly is I, I admit where my opponent may have a point. And I do it softly. I do it, I don't be like, oh, I'm not trying to, to, to make them, I'm still trying to win, right? But I, I engage in a point in a way where I concede, okay, yeah, they have a point, but, but they got this wrong and they got this wrong. And they got this wrong and here's how and that's why and that's what history is all about it's it's yes you want us you want my emotions good and it's good to you know and that's one thing that pisses me off too in graduate schools they say oh don't be emotional don't take a don't you know be uh be middle ground but you know to be honest some of my favorite writers uh, howard zinn a people's history of the united states um vargas of a crucible of struggle um, Costo of Missions of California, I'll share that. They're, they're emotional when they write. They're pissed off about racism and injustice and they say it and they write about it. And I think we, sh we need, but you wanna curb your emotion. And I think that was a good thing I learned in, in graduate school. And I see a lot of students do that because what I, you know, sometimes your emotion, it ruins your paper. And, and what I mean by that is the whole point of a paper is to prove a point and to, to prove it with historical evidence. And then you wanna just move on. You don't wanna stay on it. And uh, as emotional as life is and injustice and racism and all these things that we go through, the, you wanna you know, you wanna stay stoic. You, and I really, I think that's the point. You don't wanna be up too high or down too low, but you also don't wanna be a robot. You don't wanna be numb. So uh, it, it's a real subtle thing but you want to throw in some crazy lines every once in a while, I think, if you're writing a paper, because at the end of the day, we're human beings. And we, you don't want to just write with this. You do want to write with your heart. And, um, and that's one thing I learned over time is, and what I'm starting to do more now is I'm starting to be like, hey, look, this is me. This is how I feel about X. And then, but I'll get off of it and I'll move on. So I won't stay there. And so that allows the reader to be like, oh, you know, it kind of gets them excited and then relax, you know, you don't want to just stay excited the whole point, the whole paper. So anyway, um, so that's, that's my master's thesis, right? But before actually, there's one thing I really want to talk about that bothered me, excuse me, sorry about that. I should have had my notes ready. Um, but there was one thing that really bothered me uh, when it came to my master's thesis and I just felt like they got it, he got it wrong. You know, and I think maybe teachers forget what it's like to be a student. And because here's what they say. What's your thesis, Ethan? Well, first of all, what the hell is a thesis? <laughs> I've never heard that word in my life. Right. Like, what is a thesis? And so, well, you know, it's a statement. What's your paper about? Well, no, but what is it? And then they say a thesis is a question. Um, yes, it's a question, but not really. And then how are you supposed to know your thesis before you even start your research? And so, and so here's how I explain a thesis, which never, no one, not one person in this world has ever explained it to me, by the way. But this is how I've learned to understand a thesis is this, is your thesis is, it starts out with a question. Okay, my thesis was this, is Indian gaming good or bad? That's the question. That's not the thesis. And your thesis is the answer. Indian gaming 
is good because it eliminates poverty. It addresses socioeconomic deficits such as healthcare, um, education, infrastructure, economics. And at the same time, we're dealing with historical trauma. We've only had gaming for 30 years. Give us a break. It's not the panacea, it's not the silver bullet. We still have issues to go through. That's my thesis. But I didn't get there until the end of my research, you see? And so, and that's, that's what a thesis truly is. You shouldn't get to your thesis until the end, until you do thorough research and to watch how to do research and take notes, watch the first one, how to write a research paper on the manifest destiny being dumb luck and not divine will, God. So that was the first part of this, this paper, uh, the two-part series that I'm doing, how to write a research paper. So with, and that's why your notes uh, really matter. Obviously that was the last one, but you want to write your research paper. You don't wanna write your research paper before you even do your research. Your research will dictate your thesis statement. And this is why one of the main things I wanna talk about today is this, is um, that, <clears throat> Here's what here's how it almost always happens to me and to most people is your your conclusion is your introduction because your conclusion is is like okay alas this is where we are and like I just said about gaming I got to that at the end okay and it's like so what you do is you take that conclusion and you put it on top bam that's your introduction Indian gaming has done etc what I just said. And then that's your, that's your in introduction. And then what you do, you go down and you make a different conclusion with kind of the same words. Uh, typically your introduction is less detailed and your conclusion is more typically. You don't, cause you don't want to give it all away, right? So the introduction is just like, it's, it's an appetizer. And then your, your conclusion is the dessert. <laughs> it's like, oh, finally we're done. And we've done this and this and this, we proved this and this and this. So the, one of the last things I do, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pivot right now to what I just recently did. So I recently was commissioned to my alma mater, USD. Um, my second home, my first home is Barona, my reservation. My second home is USD. I spent a lot of time there. Did uh, three majors. My undergrad study, study did my um, graduate school work there. I didn't want to leave, basically. That's why I just kept adding majors. Um, so I just love school. That's basically why I did that. Uh, okay, so here's, here's what I did at USD. So it was commissioned to me recently uh, to build curriculum. Now, this is one of the hardest things, if not the hardest four pages I ever wrote in my life. And here's why, it's because of the content. Okay, there's two pieces. One, of, one that addresses a historical legacy of colonization in the Kumeyaay Nation. The second module discusses the Kumeyaay relationship with the San Diego Catholic Church. Holy cow. <laughs> okay. uh, that right there is just a stunning task. We realize these are complex, long stories. However you want to frame it, uh, it's up to you. Um, this obviously is about like racism as well and all these other things. And the second one um, is... Well, basically, let me just sum it up instead of reading that, that what I was trying to, what I was a commission to write on is that colonization of effects of Kumeyaay Nation for the past, since 1769, and then the relationship with the Kumeyaay people, our people, and the Catholic Church in four pages or two, you know, in a really small amount. So first of all, that's the hardest part of this project was the page number. I was commissioned to write, look, okay, you go on three or six paragraphs um, and then moving on. Okay, then there's a, a question section, a contemplative practice, reflective prompts, where you have this thing where you go to, um, you know, I'll show you what I did. The moral of the story is I'm trying to accomplish something that should be in a, a book in, in a one page, paper, a couple page papers. So that's what I was done. So first off, what I'm thinking about what I started was, I just started writing. 
Um, and so here's here's one of the things where I didn't really, and this is why I really wanted to do this 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 video to comp to accommodate the last one. The last one I I did this, you know, intricate, you know, uh, outline. Everything's nice, tidy, neat, and and you know that's a that's to me a false impression, and I don't want you to get that of what writers go through, including this, especially this writer, is sometimes you just write. Sometimes you just go for it. And, and in the case of this, I knew this material. I've been doing this for five years. I've been, I wrote a paper about Father Sarah six years ago. And this was right when he was being canonized, uh, not shot out of a cannon, but actually sanctified. Um, so I knew, I knew this stuff. I knew the effects of colonization. I talk about it on a regular. So that's the difference. I just want to make that clear is I'm writing what I really, really, really know. I've known this stuff, but I didn't know how to compact it and, and sift it and create this in such a short time. And the, the main thing, where, the reason why this was probably one of the hardest things I've ever, um, ever wrote was because it's literally one of the most important things I've ever wrote. And, you know, USD is, is a Catholic, you know, institution. When I was there, it has a lot of racism in it, for sure. Uh, most of the students are not there. There's a really small minority population. I was the only uh, local native there the whole time that I know of. Um, uh, and it was just one of these things, you know, where I was like, okay, this is, this is probably one of the most important things I'm ever going to do in my life. And they're, they're going to use this as a curriculum. This is going to address some of these issues. Um, and I'm going to help, I'm going to help, you know, my, one of my, my favorite places. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you, uh, I actually already read it, um, excuse me, um, I already uh, recorded it. So I'm going to show you an audio, but first I'm going to have to take off my, my headphones and all that. So give me two seconds, please. Okay, uh, input. So this will be an audio recording that's used for a curriculum for what I wrote. So I think this is the best way to do it. Um, okay, so that's now done. To have an accurate Indian history, oral history must be elevated in Western education. The effects of colonization have not been quantified in written documents. Most of the information in this article was collected during personal interviews with tribal members from the Kumeyaay Nation and their allies and advocates. New information from oral accounts challenges Western education and the requirement for historical sources to be written. Before three waves of encroachment, Spanish, Mexican, American, approximately 18,000 to 20,000 Kumeyaay lived in an estimated 85 villages in an area the size of Delaware. Shamuls or clans developed sophisticated political structures and a philosophy or way of knowing equal to the religions of the world. In 1769, an overland expedition led by Father Sarah and an overseas expedition led by Gaspar de Portola landed in Kumeyaay territory, changing the Kumeyaay clan structure and religion forever. The Kumeyaay experienced devastating effects from colonization, cultural genocide, language loss, and demographic collapse. Three waves of encroachment had a devastating impact on the Kumeyaay population. And by the American period, the Kumeyaay population plummeted to approximately 3,000 members or 16 to 15% when compared to pre-contact levels. By the modern American period, the average age of death for many Kumeyaay was between 40 to 55 years old. Throughout the three waves of encroachment, the problem of race was at the center of colonization. During the Spanish period, the race-based class system, known as the Costa system, defined the Kumeyaay as intellectually and physically inferior at the lowest tier of the colonial caste system. The Costa system persisted through the Mexican period and into the American period. 
in the American period, the legacy of discrimination continued in a two-tier society with Indians, Asians, Mexicans, and Blacks on the bottom tier of society. Anglo-Californians embraced their whiteness in an effort to protect white privilege. From 1848 to 1873, California Indians were hunted and killed in state-sponsored genocide, taking the innocent lives of more than 50,000 Native Americans. Epi Kumeyaay scholar David Toller states, a long history of murders, rapes, enslavement, and abuse towards the Indians of San Diego County was the order of the day in 1852 in San Diego County. In San Diego County, there is no record of mass killings during the California genocide. However, historical and archaeological evidence suggests the Kumeyaay population was decimated as a result of the initial two waves of encroachment. The Kumeyaay were marginalized in new ways after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. Native Americans in San Diego County were excluded from the Homestead Act of 1862 because they were not citizens and not allowed to vote until the American Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. Many Kumeyaay found themselves landless until the bulk of San Diego County's reservations were created in 1875 and 1893. Reservations placed many Kumeyaay in the most isolated regions of San Diego County where no one would choose to live permanently. Over the last 145 years, San Diego's reservations failed to meet the needs of reservation Indians by many socioeconomic indicators. <clears throat> reservations failed because they were designed to aid assimilation as a temporary solution to the Indian problem and never meant to be permanent. San Diego's early newspapers and a century of dishonor documented reservations in San Diego County where poverty is severe and persistent, were like third world countries. After the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act in 1988 and the gaming wars of the 80s and 90s, Indian gaming brought a significant portion of the Kumeyaay population out of poverty. However, half of all Kumeyaay tribes in the United States were unable to build successful casinos because their reservations were too distant from population centers. Weapai, Inyaha Cosmet, La Posta, Manzanita, Mesa Grande, and Santa Isabel continued to experience huge socioeconomic de deficits from the creation of the reservation system. In present day, many Kumiya still experience poverty, high unemployment, and discrimination in education. For example, Sam Brown Jr. of Viejas stated Kumeyaay youth were placed in 1A track applied arts at El Capitan instead of college preparatory classes simply because of their race. Even worse, many natives were placed in mentally retarded class, Brown notes. We all end up back to Lindo Park Elementary School. Of course, it was Lakeside Junior High and El Capitan High School. But I remember that going to school when I was in high school, some teachers didn't like Indians, you know? A lot of the Indians were in what we call MR classes, mentally retarded class. They just put them there. All the guys from Barona, they're in that class. They're in that retarded class, special needs kind of, I guess they're all called special needs now, but they just put them there. Luckily, I didn't go there, but just because you were Indian, you'd end up over there. All right. So, um, wait. W one of the things I learned, you know, it's funny. I'm learning. I, hold on a second. Let me fix my audio again before I go back on. <sighs> so. Back to my Yeti. So one of the things I learned, I swear, I, I learned so much all the time. And that's the thing about writing and playing guitar. You never stop learning. You never arrive. And one thing I learned with this project in particular is to record 
and and try to say it out loud because when i did that with this project you see me stumbling stumbling a little bit and i was like dang um and i didn't know first of all that they were going to make me record it and when they did i was like oh okay well whatever let's give it a shot and then you noticed me stumbling especially when i read that quote at the end and it was a really good you know i'm going to do it more often this time is and that's one so this is my next tip is record yourself uh, reading your paper it's one of the best things you can do because you'll find things that you know you can read you can read it a hundred times but when you record it and say it out loud you will find that thing that like doesn't make sense it doesn't fit it stumbles your words it makes your mouth you know like you have a bunch of marbles in it so read it and then if you always get someone to edit it i have my wife look at it uh, as much as i can she's the last so before you turn anything in, just have somebody look at it, read it. There's always someone we can have look at our papers, your neighbor, your, your friend, your mom, your dad, your brother, sister, whoever. Have someone edit it, read it out loud, record it. And, and so, and I have a lot of students, you know, that I know they don't do that. And it's just like, you know, you have a good paper, but when you have a grammatical error or something in there, it's like, it's just, it's not good. So do that often. Uh, when I don't have anyone edit myself, what I'll do is just um, literally read it a hundred times, like, literally like forever. Uh, my master's thesis, for example, which I should have got someone to edit, by the way. And I regret that. There's people you can pay to edit just real quick before you, you turn in master's thesis. So I, anyways, so read it out loud, um, write what you know, uh, play play these recordings back to yourself okay and so um i want to i want to go back to this paper so again this is a really hard paper this this and my and the other paper i'm going to show you took me 40 plus hours and from look from the looks of it you can't see right it's how is that 40 hours well the 40 hours is in those footnotes so you see those footnotes and I remember, um, see that, that these, these are footnotes. And my wife said, oh my God, Ethan, why are you doing that? <laughs> and it looks pretty bananas, right? But let me show you an example of why. Uh, someone who inspired me, hold on. All right, so let me, let me, um, I'm gonna do this and when, I, when I'm gonna, yeah, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but let me just finish this one, one thought. So, okay. So this book is called An American Genocide. This, this gentleman, uh, Benjamin Madley from Yale, he actually visited Barona um, and I have lucky enough to get assigned. He signed it for me, hold on a second. There we go, bam. Hi Ethan, I hope that you find this book of interest. April 7, uh, 12th, 2017. And then we did a book club in Barona. I love book clubs. There's a little book club we had. We read the book. We, uh, we explored it. Um, there's actually a, a reference here. I used, I used a, a footnote in this book to explain the two-tiered society in California after the Costa system. So I did use this book, but more importantly, I was inspired by the appendice. So the appendix... So the appendix um, is half the book, okay? So half the book. So it starts, let's just round it out. That's the appendix. Can you see that? That's the appendix. That's the book. It, I mean, it's almost the same size. Um, it actually looks, yeah. And so what, and here's why Benjamin did that. And here's why I did this is when you were going to say something so profound, so off the beaten path, so off the dominant idea of something, you better back it up and back it up in spades. Okay. And that's what I did. I believe I did. I believe I, to me, I killed it. I, I proved everything I did and then some. Because what happens is what the, a lot of the things I'm saying are very controversial and folks are going to be like, no, Ethan, you know, that's not true. Um, where does he get this from? And so 
And, and I guess the point is this, is when you're trying to really, like what I did with this one, with wampum, when you're, when you're trying to prove your point, when you're trying to really go against the grain, when you're trying to make a statement, you, you have to prove it as if you're like a lawyer and you go, okay, you know, I said this, bam, here's, here's the evidence, bam, here's the evidence. So I, I went overboard because at the end of the day, I want to win the debate and not in a, in an arrogant way, but I believe this is true kind of way. And I want to show you, look, and more importantly, you're trying to persuade people. You're not trying to create enemies. You're not trying to like, for, and this is how I, this is how I approach anything really is I'm trying to bring people over to my side. I'm not trying to, to humiliate or put you down and even take a side. I don't, I personally, I always choose the third option in life. I don't pick sides. I pick both sides and I try to bring together. And, and I, and that's why I try to um, make concessions when folks are right. But at the end of the day, I think there is a right side of history. And I think there is a right narrative and I believe in social justice. I believe that is what I'm trying to accomplish, but I'm not doing it in a, a putting you down type of way. So that's why I'm going overboard. Okay. Here's the evidence. Here's, here's a study that I did or someone did. Um, and so, and this is a good pivot to the next topic. So the next one, hold, hold on, son. I'm making a video, buddy. <laughs> I'm making a video, bub. Okay, buddy. I'm almost done, man. I'll be right there. Good morning, by the way. Good morning, son. <laughs> okay. Um, you gotta love working from home, right? So, okay. So, so now, now this, this is, I'm going to, I want to really want to talk about this next topic because this is why I didn't do it. Okay. When, when I was in graduate school, I had two options, Indian gaming, mission history. I do not like, I guess I get it from my dad, although I'm a, I'm a scrappy little thing sometimes. And I do like a good fight. I do. I do like to avoid conflict too. Actually, I really don't. I want a peaceful, happy life. Uh, I think, you know, if I can, you know, I'm only, I don't want to engage in a perpetual fight for the rest of my life. I would like to choose the middle ground. I don't want to engage in a, in a conflict, but here's the thing. So it was Indian gaming and mission history. Okay. Mission history is a big fight. History is contested ground and mission history is a war. And I was in the middle of that when I went to USD, by the way, and there was called people called mission apologists who, who are, for the mission system. And I was taught by them. And um, I, I understand that. I know their debates. I know their arguments. I was indoctrinated by them. And fast forward into my career, I start teaching at Kumeyaay College. So I had to re-educate myself. I had to learn the native perspective, um, which wasn't hard. I was born and raised on a reservation. I mean, my dad was a traditional native, uh, very traditional. We did sweat lodges, ceremony, all that. So uh, I wasn't starting from zero, but I didn't have the, the background, the book background of the mission period. I didn't have the information. So what, what I had to do was pivot to, um, look, I had to engage, I, there was no, there was, it was, it was predetermined that I was going to engage in this battle and not just engage, but I was going to be, be a, 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 a central figure in the mission debate. And I think a lot of that, the reason why is because of my background in theology. So uh, my first degree was theology. That's all I wanted to do. Study the eternal, study the transcendent, study all, all things and everything spiritual and religious. Every religion was what I wanted to do, not just Christianity. So that's my background. And then I pivoted to history because I love history. And then I love politics, so I pivot to politics. So I'm, I'm basically, my point is I was, I was in a way groomed and meant to do this mission history stuff, even though I didn't want to. It was like I was the reluctant uh, a person because I knew it was gonna be a fight and a fight it was. And I've been you know, in the middle of these fights for since I started at the Kumeyaay College and, um, you know, it's been tough from not just natives, um, but non natives. And it's just, it's just a really nasty thing. Um, and a lot of it is because of the emotion. 
a lot of it is because what actually happened and what people think happened and the mission apologists. But anyways, that's the that's the background. Okay. So here this curriculum is commissioned to me, Ethan. Give me a, a snapshot, by the way, of the Kumeyaay relationship and the Catholic Church. Like it was just simple and easy. Okay. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> um, and so what I did, so again, I've been doing this work since I got there. I had to, I teach Kumeyaay, I want a Kumeyaay too. I, I had a lot of catching up to do. And uh, so what I did, I found a book. Okay, Wampum is, is a good example, right? Of the gaming thing that was kind of set me on my path. And this, this Missions of California was really um, what creates my identity of as, um, as a Kumeyaay person and how I look at, at the mission history. Um, Mupo Costo is Coia. Uh, as you can see, I took extensive notes. And Florence Shipik is the first Kumeyaay historian, and she's in here, chapter four, I think. And Jeanette Costo, uh, his wife, Rupert's wife. So Florence Shipik is actually part one. She's right off the bat. And so, and and actually, a lot of our stories are in here. Our oral histories of our of our. Uh, Rosalie Pinto Robinson and um, a lot of these folks that are kind of um, Max Mazzetti, uh, people that were back in the day that had stories to share, our oral histories. So I had all the pieces, but okay, I wanted again, you know, here's my here, I want, I don't want to have just a, 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 a cri critical aspect of Christianity and Catholicism. Because I want to bring people over to myself, my aisle. I don't want to be a completely abrasive and just put um, one of the things, one of my professors who was, a whole family was killed in Auschwitz. He wrote a book called When Nations Go to War. One of the things he said in there as he studied conflicts of, of throughout his whole entire life was never humiliate your enemies. Never. This is what led to the rise of the, rise of, rise of the Third Reich uh, and so on and so forth. When you humiliate your enemy, you create a worse problem. And if you want to win a battle, it, it requires a compromise and your enemy to come over to your side. So what I wanted to do was I had that end goal in mind. First of all, I had all this information, but at the end of the day, you have to have a purpose, a reason for your paper. So what I did was I used Father, Father LaPointe as a counterexample to Father Sarah. Now I'm going to show you this. Um, I'm going to let it speak for itself. So let me uh, let me transition again out of my ear pods. Hold on a second, and I will show you my second piece, which is um, on the mission period. Hold on. From 1769 to 2015, Kumeyaay Catholic relations led to conflict when political agendas overshadowed religious goals. In a letter to the Viceroy, Father Junipero Serra reveals the church's strong political agenda to expand the Spanish Empire in the 18th century. Serra writes, by way of these said missions, in addition to the one here at San Buenaventura, we will see before long new and immense territories gathered into the bosom of our Holy Mother, the church, and subjected to the crown of Spain. Father Cyril served two masters, God and government. And when he was declared a saint by the Catholic church on September 23, 2015, it was a celebration of the entire colonial process. This one-sided decision by the church 
abbreviated a 250-year-old rift between the Kumeyaay Nation and the San Diego Diocese Catholic Church because the Kumeyaay perspective was never heard. Since 1987, three California Indian scholars, Florence Shippick, Rupert Costa, and Jeanette Costo, protested Sarah's canonization, stating numerous ways why Father Sarah should not be sanctified in their book, The Missions of California, A Legacy of Genocide. With one notable high point, the legacy of the mission period has led to conflict between the Kumeyaay and Catholic communities. From the beginning of Spanish encroachment, evidence of discord between the Kumeyaay community and the Spanish mestizo community is well documented in mission records. Among all mission revolts, the 1680 Pueblo Revolt and the 1775 San Diego Mission Revolt are the most significant due to their size and scope. 800 Kumeyaay from at least 15 Tipai villages participated in the San Diego Mission Revolt for several reasons. Increased baptisms, rape of indigenous women, and forced labor while malnourished. Furthermore, most Tipai Kumeyaay rejected 18th century Catholicism because they already practiced a thriving religion. The high point in Kumeyaay Catholic relations was at the turn of the 20th century, during a simpler time when the Kumeyaay people were united by practicing traditional customs mixed with Catholicism. Father Edward Lapointe, an immigrant from Quebec, exemplified the word Christianity or little Christ and was known by the 4,000 San Diego natives to sacrifice his life and possessions for the greater good of the Kumeyaay community. At the age of 21, his parents left him a personal fortune of $6,000 or 1.1 million in today's currency. And he donated every cent to serve the deeply impoverished Kumeyaay community. This was not an isolated event, and LaPointe was known to sell any material possessions he acquired to give to the poor. When he passed away, LaPointe's body was viewed at the El Cajon Catholic Church, St. Joseph's in San Diego, and the San Diego Mission de Alcala, where hundreds of Kumeyaay wept for the priest who gave it all away. The point's body was laid to rest at the church he was instrumental in building, the San Isabel Ascensia, and there has never been a Catholic figure like the point in Kumeyaay history ever since. The memory of Father the point faded, and a new era of resentment began at the conclusion of the century. In 1989, Monsignor Brent Egan wanted to build a Paris hall at the San Diego Mission de Alcala and commissioned Richard Carrico, archeologist, anthropologist, historian, to excavate the culturally sensitive site. Egan wanted to build a new hall to feed people, service the elderly, accommodate charity bingo, and hold wedding receptions. During the excavation, hundreds of Spanish, mestizo, and mostly Indian remains were found in what can best be described as a plague pit. Human remains found at the mission were disturbing and revealed the Kumeyaay and other Indians working at the mission were worked to physical exhaustion while malnourished. Carrico states, it's essentially like a prisoner of war camp, but there wasn't a war. And once you're in the system, if you ran away, they would, if they could, come and get you. So it's a little different than Auschwitz, and I use that as a very emotional term, simply because we have studied over the years both that and some other prisoner of war camps, for instance, World War II, where the Japanese didn't feed the Americans very well and worked them very, very hard. Evidence of carceral labor or prison labor was verified with a physical anthropological study performed by Rose Tyson from the Museum of Man. Tyson concluded, many individuals experience malnutrition 
from studying both enamel and bone porosity and arm bones and vertebrae showed signs of adverse stress from carrying heavy burdens or severe physical exertion. Carrico and Tyson confirmed Sherburn F. Cook's finding 43 years ago in the conflict between the California Indians and white civilization. Cook noted that in San Diego, where drought and soil were some of the worst in the entire mission system, the Indian would barely survive on 1,000 calories a day. Chairman of the pre nacra Kumeyaay Repatriation Committee, Ron Crispin from San Isabel, and his wife, Virginia Crispin from Viejas, approached the mission to stop digging. The city of San Diego and San Diego Diocese disregarded the wishes of the Kumeyaay community and refused to stop digging without due process of ceremony. Church leaders lied to the Crispins and stated, they didn't have no bones there, that there was no record of any, any kind of cemetery there, that this was not in any way consecrated ground. Then the church turned around and went to the city government and that's why when they got into a big argument with Maureen O'Connor over it. Instead of working together to resolve the issue with the Kumeyaay leaders, church leaders went on the defensive and decided to get the mayor of San Diego, Maureen O'Connor involved. The San Diego Diocese Catholic Church signed a non-disclosure agreement with Richard Carrico to keep the findings of the mission from going public, delaying justice for another generation. This case study of Kumeyaay Catholic relations from 1769 to 2015 beckons the debate. What place does politics have in Christianity? Historical evidence suggests the high point in Kumeyaay Catholic relations occurred when the Catholic Church did not have a strong political agenda. With service to the least of these, Father LaPointe exemplified the religious goals of the Christian faith with self-sacrifice and rejection of materialism. Low points in Kumeyaay Catholic relations occurred during the 1775 Mission Revolt, 1989 excavation at Mission San Diego, and 2015 canonization of Father Sarah, when political agendas overshadowed religious goals. Okay, so we are, um, that was a very emotional, challenging paper to write. Um, and yet, like I said, one of the most important things I've ever wrote because it was really, I was really, you know, what's the word, uh, making a statement that was perhaps going to ruffle some feathers, make people mad, make people upset. Um, and I had to prove it. So people don't realize that the mission period, well, a lot of these things happen and, and, and it's our burden of proof to prove them. And that's why you see down in the notes, um, I, have, I have some good amount of references and notes. And a lot of these were done by conducting interviews. Uh, and that was one of the morals of story for this, for this piece was the, and the last one was the, the, that oral history has to be elevated to written documents. And that's how the West and Anglo society has dis, um, discriminated against natives who have oral history, who have, haven't had a written, written language very long, who are, often, who are often illiterate and pass their history orally. So I use a lot of the reference. And so without the Kumeyaay Oral History Project, which took three years and thousand, two, three thousand hours to accomplish, I wouldn't have been able to do this. So a lot of this information was um, devised, you know, although I say this took 40 hours plus hours and this in the last piece, if you look at all of it in totality, it took thousands of hours to get a lot of this stuff um, here. Uh, and so we had to back it up. We had to, we had to get this information and then transcribe it and then publish it. And then now we can use it in scholarly uh, articles and stuff like this. So it was very important for me to 
not be again to bring other folks to over the over to our side and that's why i use father of the point so father of the point was this this person that was like i said he and i said sixty thousand. he gave away 60 i said six he's sixty thousand dollars of his of his inheritance and gave it to the poor father of the point was this extremely powerful um to me exemplifying what a christian truly is and what I believe, and I know a lot of folks don't, I've gotten to base over this, I think Christianity is, is not a political movement. If you study Islam, for instance, Muhammad was a political leader. The, the two fastest growing empires in the world has ever known, number one is Genghis Khan, number two is the Islamic empire. And Muhammad indeed was, is a religious movement, uh, was a religious uh, leader. Uh, but he was also a political leader. And um, Islam is intricately related to politics. That's why you see imams so political in the Middle East. If you go to Egypt, if you ever are lucky enough, they have uh, a mosque. Um, as at the Muhammad Ali, uh, not the boxer, but at the, uh, I think it's your prophet, the mosque, Muhammad Ali mosque in um, Egypt on the dollar bill. Um, not just like us and God we trust. It's like, bam, you know, there's no separation. But when you go to, so first of all, let me, uh, and I want to just carry on this, this path just a little bit longer. You know, secularism comes from Christianity, Western tradition, the separation from politics. It's not an indigenous, uh, it's not in our, our, our indigenous history at all. So I believe there is a place for that, the secular versus the sacred. And I think christianity so my point is this that was the whole point of my my paper was father sarah was a he wanted to he served two masters god and government and that's where they went wrong that's when christianity uh, to me is not is not uh, christianity it's something else it's politics then if you fast forward to the future when the the church and the city got in a fight with our our leaders that was politics over religion. And then you add Father the Point. He had nothing to do with any of that. He just he just wanted to serve the poor. And we were the poorest in the community at the time. Uh, it's It's been well documented. We we're a third world country, Barona, Vieja, Saquon, Cambo, all of them, Manzanita, and deep, deeply impoverished. Um, and so I really wanted to you know, it's again, this is stuff I've been thinking about my whole life. I've been thinking about, okay, how do we, how do we fix this debate? And how do we, how do we just answer this problem of, of the Kumeyaay Catholic relation? And then it just hit me. And it's something I've been thinking about this whole time is that Christianity is not a political movement. So that's why I call imagine a world where Christianity is apolitical. So I did that with a couple of things in mind, because I've always been trying to create a bridge. And, and I don't really see that in either side of the community and the native or the non-native they they're just fighting and there's a, a abrasiveness and hatred and um and i'm not i'm not criticizing that i get it i, I understand why why people do that but i always thought well i want it to be different i wanted to create a bridge between two communities and to me that bridge is defining christianity as an apolitical movement now, if you want two passages to that I did not put in there, but I tried, it just didn't work, is Jesus saying, I am not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. The other one is um, saying that, um, you know, give on to Caesars what is Caesars. When he was, when the Pharisees try to trap him about how to, if, who should pay taxes, Jesus says, look, that's not even my, my jam, okay? I'm doing something else. And, uh, and, you know, I don't want to, I'm not preaching here. I'm just trying to sh show you how I, I, I answered, I believe a debate with a piece of, with a, with a paper, but, um, and, but not just had an opinion, but I backed it up using father LaPointe, using father Sarah, using the 1989 excavation with Monsignor Egan, getting the, giving the, the, the San Diego mayor at the time, uh, Maureen O'Connor involved. Like, what was that? And then lying that these bones weren't even there. So um, again, and that's how I feel Father Sarah, where he went wrong. He may have been a, a, a good or bad person. I don't care. The problem with Father Sarah was he was a tool 
of empire of colonization and when we when he was colonized uh, canonized in 2015 it was a celebration of of this terrible thing that happened to us so anyways that's where i'm at uh this is the book i used um that was the curriculum i did and so i'm gonna i know this video is going on forever and i'm i'm glad so i don't mind that i hope you don't um this is something i've been actually thinking about for quite some time so i want to finish on the question section um, so these questions were created, um, not those ones. I just, I just want to do uh, just one. I'm not going to do both. I just want to show you how cool this is. So this is the curriculum we developed. And I was really, really just enthralled that USD is, is on. They're just really making great strides. So, um, and this is goes to the first piece. So remember that first piece where Brown, uh, from Viejas talked about being discriminated against back in the day they used to call it mentally retarded now you can't use that word now it's special needs but this is what words Brown used so I put it in there um, so this discrimination um, so let's 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 uh, this this kind of will you're supposed to do this after you read that first piece information shared in the content above like Brown's shocking story of discrimination education is left out of Kumeyaay history because systems of knowledge in the West are based on written sources. The requirement for primary sources to be written and not spoken has been a great disadvantage to traditional societies, societies like the Kumeyaay, who were often illiterate, passed history verbally, and did not have a written language until the 60s. Now, this is the question. Oral history is considered inaccurate or less reliable under the current system. On a practical level, what changes would USD have to make to change this implicit bias toward oral history? Next question. Oral history must be elevated in the level to the level of written documents to decolonize Kumeyaay history. What other areas of education require decolonization for indigenous people to achieve equity? Um, then this is the contemplative practice. You go to Presidio Park, you, it's, which if you haven't been, by the way, it's beautiful. I used to go there every once in a while, right across the street from US State. Imagine what it was like. That's you're sitting on the village of Kasoy the first California mission. Imagine what it was like for the Kumeyaay people to encounter Spanish and Mestizo for the first time. What thoughts and emotions would you have? Then you, there's a go deeper option. There's links to Kumeyaay.com, Indian gaming, the Kumeyaay nation, socioeconomic impact, my master's thesis and all that. Then there's uh, just a couple of cool references there. So uh, yeah, I'm just showing you what the final piece is. And I, what I really wanted to drive home though was how hard this project was. And because it was so important to me to create something that even, even the critics would read and be like, oh, you know what? That was good. I don't like it. I don't agree with it, but hey, you didn't make me feel terrible. <laughs> you know, That's one of the things I, I'd like to do when I'm teaching and just in life. I don't wanna make people feel terrible about themselves. Maybe I wanna say, hey, maybe you feel wrong. But I think um, so many writers, especially in this arena, they're not trying to accomplish that, that goal. They're just trying to accomplish their own goal and their own goal for their, for their side. But I think, you know, we should always choose that third option where when we're writing, we're thinking about our, our, counter, our, our counter opponents and then we're including them in it somehow. You're not trashing them. You may be trashing their argument, their debate, like, dude, this is, this is weak. And here's why. And here's a really big footnote, by the way, if you want reference to it. So, you know, it's, it's a hard, you know, this is, again, one of the hardest, it's the hardest thing I've ever done, the whole mission period stuff, because it's so important. But at the same time, it's probably the most rewarding thing I've ever done. Uh, and it's right on par with my master's thesis. Um, because of that. And I do hope it actually makes change. That's the end goal for me. And I'm so happy this will be, you know, I'm, I actually, I'm, I can't believe this will be curriculum at my old alma mater. This, none of this was ever there. And I felt really, really uh, um, marginalized when I was there as a, as a native student. Uh, of course, you can't tell by looking at me, but I, I always felt like in here and in here, I was, um, I was some, I wasn't, you know, the what I was told and what my dad told me was never really taught there. So I'm really happy for that. Okay, so final lessons, final lessons, okay? And I probably should have said this first. Your thesis must be narrow enough to accomplish your page number, okay?
Okay. I had one of the students I've had in the past, they wrote a Kumeyaay history paper on the whole thing. It was like, oh my God, this is just, this must have been crazy. They literally wrote the whole semester, the research paper. I'll never forget it. So that's the ultimate. And so that's, that's the uh, ultimate example of what not to do. So whenever, you know, I only do four page papers because it's junior college. If I was in uh, a four year, I would probably do eight to 10. But because we're in junior college, you know, hey, four pages, four or five. That's, that's still hard, by the way. Again, this four, these, uh, you know, six pages took me 40 hours. It doesn't mean it's not going to take you a long time. But um, so, so you want to make sure you pick an, uh, a narrow enough topic that's going to cover the page number uh, account minute maximum. Um, and so you can cover the whole topic in that amount of time. And so you want to use one, one thing I use is case study. Okay, say you want to do, uh, I have uh, a student that this year is do, doing it on poverty. Um, I want to do poverty in San Diego. I'm like, well, uh, this is what I told her um, or him. I forgot if, uh, who, who it was actually, but this is what I told them as I said this, well, do a case study, do, do a neighborhood, do a neighborhood from 1990 to 2000. Okay, do, a, do a, one neighborhood for 10 years. So you, you can write on big things. You can, but use case studies. And this is what I did with my master's thesis. I didn't write on all of gaming, although I kind of in somewhere, but I wrote on just three tribes, three tribes, that's it. So yes, I, I some chapters I casted too wide of a net. I admit that. Um, but overall, I, I think, you know, that's the moral of the story is you want these, you use case studies and time periods to limit your thing. The other, the last thing I would say is juxtaposition is, is a really important thing. Compare and contrast, juxtapose um, this culture. So if you're doing a historical trauma paper, I would do one on, on the Holocaust and the American Holocaust or the American genocide. So, so that's something I would, I, I've already done actually. I did a case study of reparations for Japanese comfort women. Uh, these were sex slaves in World War II, uh, mostly Korean by the Japanese. And I, I juxtaposed that with the American genocide, uh, California Indians. And I juxtaposed that with, the, with Auschwitz. Um, and how did reparations take place or not take place? That was one of my favorite papers I ever wrote. Um, and it's just fun. Because, you know, what happens is this is, no one's ever done that before. You know, I, I can almost guarantee it. No one has ever written a juxtaposition of Japan, uh, comfort women, American Indian genocide, and, you know, Holocaust. I, I can almost, I would bet $1,000, not one person in this planet ever wrote about it. And what happens is you're taking what everyone has and you're doing something no one's ever done. And that's what I like. That's what I, you know, that's, I live off that. I want to do something no one's ever done before. And so like this leads me to the point is be yourself, but be creative. Do something no one's ever done before. And then people will care about what you've done. If you're, if you just hash over the same stuff in the same way, the same style, who cares? So, and it, and it's important to do that in the beginning. Don't get me wrong. But if you can start doing that now, if you can start being yourself, writing what you know and what maybe other people can't know or can't do, then you actually be like, you you have this really special thing that is, is such a, you know, it's uniquely you. And we are all unique people, every single one of us. And there's something, there's something that you can do that other people can't just by being born and being positioned. Okay, my kids and my family's wrestling. Okay, let me wrap this up. Okay, so we talked about that. What I'm going to also say too is your as a final thing, your conclusion is often your introduction. Okay. Um, you start out with a question after your research, that question becomes your thesis. Okay. Um, uh, write what you know, play your recording. So you record yourself and then play it to yourself. Uh, say it out loud and record yourself. Okay. So I know this was a crazy video. Uh, again, this is something I've been working on. I hope I gave it all to you. The last thing I want to say is this. Okay, writing is a full body experience. You have to exercise. You have to eat right. You have to sleep right. 
Um, you have to, it's mind, body, and spirit. I went through, I went on a run this morning before I did this video. That's going to make this video better. My, my blood is flowing. So you have to think about um, your whole body, your whole mental, physical body, your circadian rhythm. You want to do that. And that's going to allow you to accomplish things you've never done before. Push past your limits and renew. You don't want to burn out. So you want to keep that get your desk right, get your seating right, get a comfortable chair, focus on your, your, your posture, make sure you're, you don't get arthritis like me, carpal tunnel, all of that. So that's, that's a little health tip for you. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it was a lot, but I gave you the whole kitchen sink and more. Uh, until the next video, thanks for coming.